Hello again. We start today a study of the eighth chapter of the Epistle to the Romans by the Apostle Paul. This is the conclusion of Paul's thesis, that only in the gospel of Christ is any man justified. That is, all the way from Adam until now, men are justified only in the blood of Christ. Paul's discussion had to do with the fact that sin reigned in this world from the time of Adam, chapter 5. Then he told us, but you need to obey the gospel now. You have to obey from the heart that pattern of teaching, that death, burial, and resurrection of the Christ, according to Romans chapter 6. And then he, in a parenthetical study, looked at what it must have been like to live under the law of Moses without justification. And he talked about being a wretched man and living in the flesh. The particular words that Paul uses in the book of Romans have given people trouble forever. He used the word flesh to mean sometimes our bodies, but sometimes, and most of the time when he's discussing law, he means the law of Moses, especially when he contrasts it with the word spirit, contrasting two systems, the law of Moses and the law of Christ. And under that law of Moses, he was wretched. He could not find what he wanted. He could not do what he wanted to do, and that is to be justified. But as he comes to chapter 8, or what we call chapter 8, as he comes to this portion of his thesis that only in the gospel are men justified, Paul says we have a victory. There is therefore now, under the gospel system, no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. It's passingly interesting that many, many today teach that one should ask Jesus to come into his heart. The Bible nowhere suggests such. In fact, it always talks about being in Christ. In Paul's writings, 169 times he mentions being in Christ. That's an overwhelming idea. Not that he, we ask Him to come into our hearts, but we have a process by which we get into Him where justification is. Do you not know that so many of us as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ? Galatians 3, 27. But here in Romans 8, the shout of victory under the law of Christ that He calls here the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, verse 2, chapter 8, there is no condemnation. We are a justified people. We are Christians saved by the grace of God through the gospel system that has provided this victory over sin. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. What an amazing thought. We were told by Paul that the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. That's the law of sin and death. Sin, when it's finished, bringeth forth death. James told us, James 1, 13 through 15. It isn't a good thing to stay in that place called sin. We need release from it. And the law, notice there's a law today. It's called the perfect law of liberty, James 1, 25. It's called the law of Christ, Galatians 6, 2. There's a law today. That's the gospel system. And that gospel system, that law of the Holy Spirit's instructions, that law that the Holy Spirit has given us, has made us free from the universal law of sin and death. The wages of sin is death. Why is that important? You remember that he discussed already that under the law of Moses he could not be justified. And so in verse 3 of chapter 8 he tells us, for what the law could not do. What law? The law of Moses. Notice, friends, there are three laws mentioned here. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Now that statement alone shows us that people who say we're under grace only today have made a huge mistake because Paul says it's a law, this gospel system. And, when, and the reason it's a law is it's governing a process, a process of being born again. And where there's a process, there has to be some law behind it. And that law is coming from the instructions of the Holy Spirit. That's why Paul said, for by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. 
1 Corinthians 12, 13. That is, by the instructions of the Holy Spirit, all of us are baptized into the same church. And that law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus makes us free, justifies us from the law of sin and death. What a wonderful shout of victory here. We have the way to overcome the reign of sin in our lives. The law of Moses could not do that. Verse 3. So notice three laws. Law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, law of sin and death, the law of Moses. And the contrast is amazing. The law of Moses was not designed to justify. It could not in that it was weak through the flesh. It's interesting to note, if I were a Jew living under the law of Moses, that the moment I discovered I had sinned, I had reached the age of accountability, I was required to take an animal to sacrifice, or maybe a grain offering, or uh, an oil offering, or a wine offering of some kind, to the priest. And he would tell me, that's the right offering, now you offer it. But as I went away, being an imperfect man, keeping a perfect law, I would still be imperfect, because it's impossible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin, Hebrews 10, 1 through 4. But the law was weak through the fact that imperfect men were keeping a perfect law. It's weak through the flesh. It's not the law's fault. It wasn't designed by God to justify. God had in mind in the future the gospel system which would justify men. But there's an important point made at the end of verse 3 for us. God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Christ came in the likeness of a man. Why was He different? He never sinned. He didn't know sin, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. The apostle is clear here and very careful to say he came in the likeness. He's different from man in a sense because he was 100% God in the flesh of man. But here is an interesting point. He came as a man. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, John 1, 14. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh. He looked like a man. If you saw Him, if you talked to Him, He looked like a man. And He came for sin, that is, to conquer its reign. Condemned sin, now watch this, in the flesh. That tells me that it's possible for me to conquer the problem of sin. I'm not beholden to it. I don't have to sin. And that is an important point for us who are disciples of the Christ, that we have a victory, a way to overcome the problems of life. That is so important. You remember when Jesus was tempted by the devil. The record is in Matthew, the fourth chapter, and other chapters of the Gospel systems. You remember that Jesus said three times to the devil, Here's the way I'm going to overcome your temptation. It is written, it is written, it is written again. Isn't that amazing? That the Bible's teaching can help me overcome the reign of sin. And Christ showed us that in the flesh. And so He came to show us, here's how we have victory over what the law of Moses required. Here's how we have victory over the reign of sin. And here in the Christ is the condemnation of sin itself. It's interesting that we have a victory, that the righteousness of the law, verse 4, might be fulfilled in us. What the law of Moses demanded was fulfilled in us when we obeyed the gospel of Christ. The law of Moses demanded sacrifice. Christ provided that. That's why there's no condemnation. We should not, as Christians, walk around thinking of ourselves as some kind of a sinner or a terrible person. We are in the place of victory. The law's requirements are fulfilled in us that who walk not after the... Now, in this verse, Paul talks about after the flesh. Again, when he contrasts it with the word spirit, he's telling us, don't walk after the ancient law of Moses or the way of the world. Walk after the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, which makes us free from the law of sin and death. Isn't that an amazing challenge? That it's possible for us 
to live after the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. We need to make an effort, but it is highly possible. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. If my mind's on the ancient system, as the Jews uh, had it, if my mind's on the law of Moses, if that's what I want to follow, that's the thing I'm going to pay attention to. And many today claim that they are following the Ten Commandments. Wrong law. Wrong law. Chapter 7, you remember, and verse 7, What shall we say then? Is the law of sin? God forbid. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. That's one of the Ten Commandments. And that particular system cannot save me. But many mind the things of the Ten Commandments today, and therefore do not obey completely or fully or in the correct way the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And these folks, even if they were minding the things of the flesh of the world, would have the same problem. And so we don't want to be thinking of another system that makes us free from the law of the sin and death. But they that are after the Spirit, those who follow the teachings of the Holy Spirit, mind the things of His teaching. It's interesting that what we have on our minds is what we are. It's what we're becoming, what we're thinking. I sometimes tease my students and tell them, don't think about oranges for the rest of the day, just testing whether or not this is a correct way of thinking about things. And of course, they're going to be thinking about oranges. I tell people that if they want to die, don't think about a diet. In order to process correctly what it is I want to be, I have to do something else, not concentrate on it, or I'll be defeated in the sense that I won't be thinking about the right things. And so what am I going to do as a Christian? I'm going to take a look at the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. I'm going to understand its teachings, and I'm going to do whatever it takes to be free from the law of sin and death. Those things I'm going to mind. Those things I'm going to think about. For to be carnally minded is death. Thinking about the wrong things leads to the wrong conclusions. How many times have I heard someone say, I know what the Bible says, but that's a sad statement. The Bible says it, then I ought to do it. Well, I know what the Bible says, but I don't believe it. Well, it says it. And when it says it, and I do something else, that's carnal mindedness. When it tells me not to be worldly and I live in the world, that's carnal mindedness. When it tells me to follow the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus and I follow the law of Moses, that's carnal mindedness. And the end of those things is death. And I want to be free from that law of sin and death. I want to be free from it, and so I think about something else. To be spiritually minded. What is it then to be spiritually minded? Is that some mystical idea? No. Is that some hidden, abstract thought? No. Is that some emotional outburst, some convulsion? No. To be spiritually minded, according to the Apostle Paul, according to the Bible, is to do what the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus tells me to do. And that brings me life, Paul says, and peace. You remember he said that we have peace with God because we're in Christ. Isn't that a wonderful, wonderful place to be? Any place else? I'm carnally minded. Those who ask Jesus to come into their hearts, as we mentioned earlier, are carnally minded. They're asking the Lord to do what the Lord told them to do, and that was to get into Him. And so we want to understand that if we're following the law, the New Testament system, the gospel, then it brings life and peace. Why is that, Paul? The carnal mind is enmity against God. I become God's enemy when I try to do it some other way from the way He instructed me. When I try to live in the world or follow the law of Moses, I am an enemy of God Almighty. For it is not the mind, that one that's trying to do it some other way, is not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can be. Why? Because of its process of thinking. Listening to a preacher on one occasion, he was trying to use this particular verse here, verse 7, to say that those in the world are not subject to the law of God. Therefore, 
we don't need to teach them God's law until they obey the initial gospel system. And then from then on, they need to be living according to God's law. But whatever they did before that is overcome by the gospel. He was trying to insist that people living in adultery in the world, once they're baptized into Christ, can stay with that mate. Well, that would be the continuance of adultery. It means that the person did not repent of the situation in which he had found himself when he learned he needed to be baptized for the mission of his sins. Friends, baptism is not a marriage ceremony. It requires repentance prior to its application. Baptism does. We have to be fixing the situation, getting out of it. If I were to steal your money, wouldn't you think I'd have to give it back before I was baptized for remission of my sins? If I stole your house or your car, would I not have to give it back? What's the difference if I were to steal your wife? I would have to give it back. What this means is not that he's not subject in the absolute sense, because all men are amenable to the law of Christ. It's the only thing that can make them free from the law of sin and death. What he means here is that the man who deliberately is carnal-minded, the man who decides to think that way, the man who wants to follow either the law of Moses or the world, is God's enemy. And he couldn't be subject to the law of God with that mindset, could he? But this doesn't have anything to do with a person living in the world not being amenable to the law of Christ, because he is. Every person has to obey the gospel in order to be saved. And those who do not, according to 2 Thessalonians 1, 6 through 8, are lost eternally. We have then a wonderful, wonderful thought. I don't have to be in the flesh. I don't have to live in the world or be, try to be subject to a law that's contrary to the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Because if I do, I cannot please God. Look at verse 8 there. So they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Well, I'm in my body. That's the way I am. So he doesn't mean in the flesh that way. I was put in the body by the process of natural birth. That's God's system. And so he can't mean that if you're in a body, you can't please God. He does mean that if you're trying to follow some fleshly system, be it the law of Moses, which is under discussion here, or the carnal system of the world, you cannot please God. There isn't any way to do that. A recent statistic I read says that over 65% of the American public never one time darkens the door of any kind of a church. That's a huge number of people who cannot please God. Isn't that sad? What a sad thought that is. Paul continues his discussion. But ye are not in the flesh. Well, I'm in my body. But I'm not under the law of Moses. And neither am I in the world. I think he means here specifically, you're not under the law of Moses. You're under a different system. That's how he started this text out. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That's the system I serve. That's the teaching I follow. You're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. God dwells in us, John the Apostle told us. Christ dwells in us, John said. The Holy Spirit is said to dwell in us, Paul told the Corinthians, in that particular miraculous setting. But that relationship with God, the Christ, and the Holy Spirit began at baptism. We are baptized into a relationship with, into the name of. We are baptized in order to a relationship with God, the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. If I'm not following the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, I don't belong to Jesus. I belong either to some other system or I belong to the world. One of the saddest instances of corruption I have noted in over 50 years of preaching now is to watch a member of the Church of Christ go into some denominational realm 
or go back into the world. What can you find there? Peace? I don't think so. Life? No. Can you find salvation? No. Why would you go? Why would you leave the Christ? You're none of His now. You're not following the system that He set forth for you to follow. You're not His child in the faithful sense anymore. What a sad place to find oneself. Many people use verse 9 here to talk about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. This verse isn't discussing the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. This verse is discussing the position that a person must be in in order to be pleasing to God. He must be under the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, or he cannot please God. I heard a preacher on one occasion say that every day of his life he prayed for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Well, I asked him what verse he used. He said Luke 11, 13. If you have a New Testament, you might want to look at that verse with me. Luke 11, 13. For here the, uh, the uh, great physician, the, uh, not the great physician, but the physician Luke wrote, If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? And so this preacher said that he prayed every day for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. I was puzzled about that. Why would he pray for something that he believed was automatically given to him at baptism? Did the Holy Spirit leave every day and had to come back? Well, he said, Christ said to pray for the Holy Spirit. No, he didn't say pray for it. He said, pray for it in this sense only. Look at Matthew 7, 11. If ye then being evil, see this is the cross reference, the meaning of Luke eleven thirteen. If ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask Him? What are the Holy Spirit's good things? They're listed for us in Galatians 5, 22 and 23 a whole host of characteristics that belong to the Christian. He's not talking about asking for the person of the Holy Spirit. He was talking about asking for the good things that the Holy Spirit instructs. But it would be interesting to know something. If I have to pray every day for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, is it the case that the Holy Spirit leaves me? If He did, according to verse 9 of Romans 8, that is used as an indwelling passage when it isn't, According to this passage, when he's left, we're none of his. So how does a person who's none of his pray for him to come back? The whole thing is puzzling because it's incorrect doctrine. Verse 9 of Romans 8 is not an indwelling passage. It's a statement about what it is that we are when we are under the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That is Christ in us when that happens, because we've obeyed the gospel. We've been baptized into Christ. And so he writes, If Christ be in, be in you, the body is dead. Anything that you were doing that is not subject to the law of Christ is gone now. You're in a different situation because of sin, but the Spirit is life. Following the whole New Testament system is life because that system makes us righteous. And that was the entire discussion, really, from Romans 1, 16 through with the point where we are now, that only in the gospel can a man be justified. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies. That is not a resurrection passage. My mortal body is the one in which I'm, right, I'm living right now. It's made alive. I have a new life in Christ. That's the point. We have been raised to walk in newness of life out of that watery grave of baptism. We have been changed, translated, made a different people. And so our mortal bodies now are <laughs> full of the life of Christ by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. What a marvelous victory shout. Again, I must repeat that. We have because we have new life. And that's the way we walk in Christ. Therefore, brothers, 
We are debtors, not to the flesh, not to some other system like the law of Moses that he called flesh, chapter 7, or not to the world. We're not debtors. We don't owe them anything. We don't have to live after those systems, those worldly systems, those systems that the ancient Jews understood to be their system. We're not debtors to any of those. For if you live after any of those systems, especially the law of Moses, ye shall die. Did you know that if you're trying to be justified by the law of Moses, you're falling from grace? You know, there are people who think they can't fall from grace once they're saved. But Paul said quite clearly to the Galatian brethren, those of you who are trying to be justified by the law, you're fallen from grace. We don't want to live after that system. But if ye through the Spirit, that is through His teaching, verse 2, the law of the Spirit, if we'll follow His teaching, if you do that, you'll mortify the deeds of the body. When I start listening to what the Holy Spirit teaches in the New Testament, I start to change the way I live. That's my job. God doesn't do that for me. I have to put off that old man and put on the new one. But if I, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, that's new life. That's victory. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. What a wonderful shout. Is, are there blessings in all of this? Yes, watch now. And each one of those blessings I have alliterated with the letter H. I don't know what we do without the letter P when we alliterate, but I'm using the letter H here. Notice the first blessing of having the victory in Christ Jesus. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, that is, those who follow His teaching, they are His sons. Notice that blessing. We are His sons. Oh, how did that happen? Look at the next verse. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. We're not under the law of Moses anymore. We don't have a disposition of following the world. But ye have received the spirit of adoption. God adopted us and made us His Son. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew Him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know this, that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And every man that hath this hope in Him purifies himself, even as He is pure. 1 John 3, 1 through 3. Notice, we have been adopted into the family of God. It's interesting when you read the word adoption in the Roman epistle, and think about the way the Romans adopted a child, Something marvelous comes to our minds. <coughs> the Romans, <coughs> when they intended to adopt someone, simply went and purchased him. They purchased the child. They paid for him, and they went home with that child. You and I are purchased possessions of God, paid for by the very blood of Christ, Acts 20, verse 28, paid for by the very life that He gave, we have become adopted into the family of God. He, Christ, is a son by inherent nature. We are sons by adoption. We are therefore crying, Ava, Father. We are now in an intimate relationship with God Almighty. Shout victory. I'm in God's family. He's my Father. I can call on Him as my Father. I can talk to Him directly through Christ, and both the Holy Spirit and the Christ we'll learn toward the end of this chapter. Help us in those prayers. We are His sons. And how do we know we're His sons? The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirits that we are the sons or children of God. When I know what I have done in order to follow the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. When I check that out with the Bible, the Holy Spirit bears witness with my spirit, not to it, 
not direct operation, but with it, that I am God's son. Not only am I his sons, notice what he says next. We are heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. Whatever Christ received when he went back to heaven after suffering such a humiliation on earth, we receive. We're going to be made to sit down on his throne according to the revelation. We are joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Not only are we his sons, not only are we heirs, joint heirs with Christ, but there's a harvest time coming. Watch. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. There's a time coming when something glorious is going to happen. I call it harvest time. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. What a day that will be when this creature waiting for the making known of the sons of God, for that time when Christ says, well done, good and faithful servant. The creature being differentiated here from the sons of God waits for that event also. Who is this creature? What is this creature? It was made subject to vanity, not willingly. It didn't want to be subject to death, to emptiness, to nothingness. God did that. He subjected the creature to death. There's a reason for that. It's stated in Romans 5 that when sin came into the world, death followed as the consequence. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption. It's coming out of corruption somehow into the glorious liberty of the children of God. What an amazing discussion if we knew what the creature was. Well, let's follow on here. He says, think about the whole creation. Every year on my property, the trees all look as if they died in wintertime. No leaves, nothing, no green, but comes the spring and resurrection occurs. And we've seen that over and over again when there are changes in the seasons. We know that. The whole creation groans and travaileth in pain together until now. The creation itself keeps giving rebirth or birth again and again and again. We know that. Well, why are we amazed that the creature could be reborn? Let's see what that creature is. Let's read verse 23. And not only they, but ourselves also. Paul mentions the apostles waiting for that same day of harvest, that same harvest time day, that same day when this creature comes out of the corruption. Let's read. Not only but they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. These miraculously endowed apostles also wait for this day of victory. Waiting for the adoption, what, Paul? To this end, to wit, the redemption of our, here's the creature, body. Even the body itself in which I now live, planted in the grave, has a day when it will be harvested. We read 1 Corinthians 15, and we note that this which was corrupted must put on incorruption. It, this body, is sown a natural body. It, same thing, is raised a spiritual body. It's interesting. I live in the seed. I live in the creature. I am different from the creature, but I live in it. And so one day there's going to be a harvest time. We are his sons, heirs with Christ, joint heirs. Everything that he received becomes ours. Our bodies will be resurrected at the harvest day when the sons of God come before God. And not only that, we have hope. I'm told that there are folks right here in Memphis, Olive Branch, South Haven, anywhere you think, who are so lonely, living without hope, that they actually call these numbers for the weather or the time just to hear another human voice. Can there be anything sadder than that? We are not like that as Christians. We have hope, not wishful thinking. We expect it because it's there. We desire it 
because it's there. And that desire, plus the expectation that we will receive it, is the Christian's hope. And that saves us. How do folks come to the end of life without hope? How do folks come to the end of life without faith, hope, love? The greatest of these is love. How do they do that? How do they die outside of Christ? How do they enter eternity? No hope. W.A. Bradfield, the great preacher of yesteryear, vice president of Freed Hardeman at one time in his life, he used to have a sermon in which he would yell at the end to people, no hope without Christ. No hope, no hope. The Gentile lived, a lot of the Gentiles did prior to the gospel system, without hope in the world, Ephesians 2.12. Many today, too many today, live without hope, but the Christian has hope. And when we have that hope, we with steadfastness, he says, verse 25, the word patience there meaning steadfastness, perseverance, we stay with the Christian faith because of hope. We know there's no hope out there in those other systems. There was no hope under the law of Moses. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of that death? But now, no condemnation in Christ Jesus. We walk after the law of the Spirit. We have hope. We are His sons, heirs. There's a harvest time even of our bodies coming, and we have hope. But there's something else. We have help. What a wonderful thought. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. In what area? The providential area of life, infirmities. We have no revealed will of God in this area. The final will of God cannot be changed. Prayer won't change it. If I die and go to the other place, whatever I was, I'm going to be there. Let him that is filthy be filthy still. Let him that is righteous be righteous still according to the revelator. So there's no changing the final will of God. God's revealed will cannot be changed. I have to pray according to it, 1 John 5, 14. But there is a providential will of God about which I know nothing. I can't know what the outcome would be if I'm told that my child has cancer or my mate is dying. What do I pray? Am I going to pray the wrong thing? Am I going to be going against God's will? Paul says, no, the Holy Spirit helps us here. He pray for, we don't know pray, what to pray for in those situations. So we can't make a mistake. The Spirit itself makes intercession for us with words that baffle sighs, with groanings that cannot be uttered. The Holy Spirit takes that prayer before God and it becomes all right no matter what we ask. I remember one time my wife telling me that when our children were little that she prayed one day that she could find their shoes because they seemed to be lost. And I said, stupidly, I, which is the way I say a lot of things, I said, well, he's not, God's not interested in those shoes. She said, well, I found them. <laughs> we pray for things. Maybe we don't know what the will of God is in these areas of providence, in these areas of infirmities. We have help there. That prayer cannot be wrong for the Christian. That's the great help. And he, the Father, that searcheth the hearts, remember 1 Samuel 16, he's the heart searcher, knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. What a wonderful help that is. There's something else in this help that has to be kept in mind. We know that all things, all of the things that God worked out, in the gospel system. Work together for good to those that love the Lord and are the called according to His purpose. What was His purpose? A predestined plan to save all of us. And that's what He's talking about in verses 28, 29, and 30, that God had a predestined plan that His sons, His heirs, those who would be coming out of the bondage of corruption at harvest time, those who have hope and help even in prayer, those folks were predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. That's the plan. 
Not that God said in the, uh, before He created man, uh, Keith, you're going to be saved, and John, you're going to be lost. But God had a plan to conform those who would obey the gospel, Romans 1, 16, to the image of His Son. And that happens when we study the Word of God, 2 Corinthians 3, 18. Why His Son? He's the firstborn among many brothers, firstborn out of the grave, never to die again, firstborn in the sense that He is the author and captain of our salvation. He is the firstborn. That's the plan. When I think about all things working together for good, I don't imagine something like this. Well, the day my brother was killed, that caused my sister to obey the gospel. Because all things work together for good to those that love the Lord. I don't imagine that kind of a scenario. Because that would say that the death of Christ on the cross wasn't enough. That somebody else had to die so that my sister would obey the gospel. It can be that things in life can affect the way people think. There's no doubt about that. But the impetus, the point that gets people to obey the gospel is love of Christ and for what He did. That's the predestined plan, that the Son would save us and we would be conformed into His image, that all things could include everything God has done according to Romans chapter 8. That would be part of the all things work together for good. But there's another way, I think, to think about that, that no matter what happens to me in this life, at the end I'm going to be delivered from the corruption. I have a harvest time coming. And so really whatever happens to me here is if I'll remain faithful, it works out for that which is good. Because he ends that sentence with, to those that love God, and are the called according to His purpose. What was His purpose? To conform us into the image of His Son. And we then are those who were called to Him. That is, we were called by the gospel, 2 Thessalonians 2, 14. Not in some convulsion or some loud voice in a field somewhere, or some still small voice or, or some quiet whisper. Everybody has to hear the gospel and obey it. And when He does, all things work together for good to those that love the Lord and are the called according to His purpose. So we have a mitigated thought there in Romans 8, 28, that you have to be one of God's children, His Son. You have to be His heir. You have to remember that your hope is in Him and your help is in Heaven. Even when you pray and you don't know what you're praying, there's help in Heaven. When we remember all those things, those things motivate us to be faithful, to be conformed to the image of His dear Son. That's His plan. That's His predestined plan. Oh, predestination is taught in Scripture, but not the kind taught by John Calvin and others, where everything that happens, God decided to do it. I heard a, an account of a debate between a gospel preacher and a predestinationist preacher. And that predestinationist preacher set an apple on the dais and said that God did from all eternity determine that that preacher would eat that apple during the debate. With that, the gospel preacher jumped up, grabbed the apple, and ate it, trying to show that gentleman that those things that he was teaching were in total error. There is a predestined plan, but there is no predestination of who will obey that plan. But those who do are predestined to be conformed to the image of His dear Son, because they are called people by the gospel of Christ. Now, what do you conclude about all this, Paul? Uh, we have a victory, no condemnation in Christ Jesus. We ought to shout that. Huh? We have a victory. We are standing uncondemned before God. We are justified people. Oh, not sinlessly perfect, but justified by the blood of Jesus Christ. Why? Because we obeyed the gospel. 
Oh, shout victory. Let's keep shouting it. So what do we say to these things? That we are His sons, heirs. There's a harvest time even of our bodies. We have hope. We have help in heaven, even in prayer, when we don't know what's going on in life sometimes and we pray, is this prayer acceptable to God? Heaven makes it so. Having all of those things, what shall we conclude? What shall we say to these things? Verse 31. Well, Paul says, here's my conclusion. If God be for us, who can be against us? A beloved teacher of mine used to say, God and one man is a majority. Well, yes, but actually God is the majority. When God is for me, there isn't a soul, an incident in life, an obstacle, an enemy who can be against me. There isn't any way to defeat God. I've often wondered just how dense Satan is to think that he could defeat God and take over heaven. How would that be possible? To defeat the almighty, all-knowing, all-powerful. God knows my thoughts before they form. And if He is on my side, no matter who the enemy is, be he a terrorist, an errorist, the devil himself, he can't defeat me. I walk after the Spirit of, the law of God in Christ Jesus. I walk after that law delivered by the apostles and inspired men called Scripture. And nobody can defeat me. Paul argues, here's how I know this, brethren, that if God be for us, nobody can be against us. Here's how I know that. He that spared not his own son. You ever thought about what that must have meant to God. I've often imagined some kind of a discussion between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I've often wondered what they were discussing. In fact, at that time, He wasn't even the Son yet. He was the Word, John 1.1. 1, 1. And they began to discuss this creation. Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. So in the image of God made He man. What kind of a man are you going to make here? Well, He's going to be like us, so He'll be creative. He'll be able to make decisions. He'll know uh, uh, how to love because we're not going to make Him a robot. He's like us. He's a thinking, feeling, creative being. Well, that's dangerous. Why is that dangerous? Because now he has the choice either to love or not love us. And you remember what a bad choice Adam and Eve made. What bad choices those two made when they decided they wanted to be the bosses. They wanted to know and decide what was good and what was evil. So they grabbed the tree. So many do that today, and therefore God is not for them. Everything's against them. But what caused God to give this victory to His children? Well, He didn't even spare His own Son, did He? Well, doesn't that say something to you? If He would send His Son for you, isn't He on your side? And so Paul asked the question, How shall He not, God, with Him, Christ, also freely give us all things that pertain to life and godliness, 2 Peter 1, 3. Did God give us all things that pertain to life and godliness? Yes, they're recorded for us in Holy Writ. What a great present. This gift of the Bible is equated with the gift of His Son. God put His own breath in this Word. 
Romans 10, 17, Ephesians 6, 17. The same breath that He put into the dust of the ground that made man is found in the living message of Almighty God. And that living message gives us all things. Every blessing, every victory is in Christ. What's your argument, Paul? He, God, who has already done so much, spared not His own Son, is sure, sure to do much more. Really? Yes. I have to face Him someday. He's my judge, Jesus is, John 5, 22. What will be my argument? My argument is not necessary when I'm His Son. He will recognize that. He will know I'm His child. He will simply say to me, enter into the joys of your Lord. It's not necessary for me to make any argument. But there was a time when Satan made an argument with God about a man named Job. Sadly, Job had no Savior. You and I do. Job had no advocate in heaven. You and I do. Job didn't have a lawyer to argue his case. You and I do. What a great blessing that God has done for us in Christ as we walk after the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. We're told, according to the Revelator, Revelation 12, 10, that the accuser of our brethren has been cast down. Why did God send His Son? God sent His Son to limit the power that Satan had. Hebrews 2, 12. That power limited means that He cannot accuse us the way He did Job. Because if anyone brought an accusation against us on the judgment day, God would simply say, my child has a lawyer. Go talk to him. We have an advocate with the Father. Listen to him. Come on, John. Jesus Christ, the righteous, 1 John 2, 1. You and I are indeed blessed when we're his children. For we have a lawyer in heaven, the one that God sent. And so what's your question now, Paul? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Are you worried about Judgment Day, fellow Christian? Faithful Christians have no worries. We have a lawyer there. And we're not going to be charged with anything when we're justified. Well, I just sinned, Keith. Well, ask God to forgive you. Get right, right this moment. And you'll be all right. And there won't be any charge to you. God doesn't bring those sins up again at the Judgment Day. Their sins and iniquities will I remember no more, Hebrews 8, 12. Brothers and sisters and friends, it is God that justifieth. If God be for us, who can be against us? Even at harvest time, when the body itself is resurrected and we stand before Christ, God's on our side. And so we go to reward day, actually as a Christian, not judgment day. Who is he that condemneth? Same question. Nobody can. It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God. Now watch this. Not only did the Holy Spirit uh, get into this process of making intercession for us, but Christ does too. There are two intercessors in heaven, only one mediator. 1 Timothy 2.5. A mediator stands between two parties, satisfying the needs of both. An intercessor simply stands by a person's side and pleads his case. Christ is both mediator and intercessor. The Holy Spirit is not a mediator, but He is an intercessor. You have the two persons in the Godhead arguing your case. What is against us then? What is against us then? Nothing. That's the shout of victory. Heaven itself is pulling for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? 
What about trial? No. No. Well, I'm distressed. I'm having real difficulties. Must be that God doesn't love me. No, He loves you. Well, I'm being persecuted. No, I don't have enough to eat. No, He still loves you. I don't have enough to wear. I'm having all of these dangerous things. In fact, I'm having to go to war. No, He still loves you. Wow, victory. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Whatever happens in this life works out for good in the end. I heard two Christians speaking one day, and one said, well, you're getting older. And the other one said, well, considering the alternative. I interrupted the two, and I said, could I ask you a question? Of course. They, I said, what's the alternative but paradise? Nay, in all these things, we are super victors. Paul actually coined a term here in the original language. We are more than conquerors. Super, in fact, hupercomine, super victors. It's not just a victory, it's a super victory. You want to know about the Super Bowl of life? You win, my friend, in Christ. You and I are victorious in Christ. It's a super victory when we overcome. We are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. For I am persuaded, now watch this, everything man fears, is listed here. Death, people fear that. That's not going to keep the love of Christ away. Life itself, people have problems living, don't they? Or otherworldly things, angels and principalities or powers of things. Today, people have trouble with today. They have trouble with tomorrow. All of these things people fear. Height, I have a kind of fear of heights when I'm in a tall building looking down. Depth, people don't want to go too deep. Or any other being shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Apostle Paul has concluded his thesis that only in the gospel of Christ is a man justified. Only in the gospel of Christ can we be sure of the love of God. Can we be sure that we are being conformed to the image of His dear Son? Can we be sure that we are His sons? But if we are, we are joint heirs with His Son. We have the promise of the resurrection of our bodies. We have the great, great hope in Christ. And in heaven itself, the Holy Spirit and the Lord Jesus Christ are helping us in prayer and in living. And there's nothing, friend, that can separate us from the love of Christ except one thing. I could walk away, but God being my helper, I'm not going anywhere. Thank you for your kind attention.